All right, all right, everybody, welcome. It's Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. My name's Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network, because we meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. So welcome, everybody. We're taking on this subject here. Let me switch to the overhead. So we're drawing this iguana. Uh, it was this Jackie, I think, that you had sent this uh, subject, put this kind of on my plate. Um, if, if yes, thank you for doing that. I, I did find this image here in particular that I thought would work for us to deal with today. It's got a really nice contrast between light and shadow. Um, but I think the, the main focus for me in this subject is really tackling all those details. So this is all about using our power of suggestion to convey as much of a sense of that, that detail, that texture, without having to get in there and do all of it if you don't want to. So I know some of you may really enjoy getting in there and getting all those intricate details. And if that is your sensibility, then hopefully what this will do is give you a foundation from which you'll be able to continue to build your own drawing and keep moving forward with it. Um, okay, so if you're new, I wanna welcome you. It's great to have you here. Uh, again, this is all about, about us getting together to draw together because it takes practice, it takes dedication, um, and a certain amount of intention to improve as an artist. So each week we choose a new subject and we focus on drawing this, not because we need more artwork for our walls or we're trying to get ready for a show, but because this is the grinding work that we do as artists to keep... Uh-oh. Let me see. I got a call that came in there. That was weird. All right. And so uh, and again, this is the grinding work that we do as artists so that we keep improving over time. So, um, all right. And I did, I, of course, I keep changing my setup. So I apologize <laughs> if everything's not working, but I think everything should be working and working and in sync now. Um, but if you notice that words and my movements are out of sync, let me know. I'm doing my best to try to make it better every time. Okay. Reference image is in the description below. So if you do want to follow along, you can find that this one that's right below me on the screen, you'll find in the description below. You will also find the link to the show page on artistnetwork.com where you can share your work when you're done. You don't have to share your work, but I love seeing all of it. And I do enjoy um, both the successes and the ones in which you struggle. Because again, this is all about the grinding work we do as artists. It's not about perfecting the drawing, it's about perfecting the practice of drawing. It's about drawing over the drawing. So, uh, all right, well, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'm in, in sync a little bit better. When I, I practiced recording earlier and everything seemed to be synchronized. Um, okay, let me see, shoot. I'm going to, this is what happens when you, uh, uh, every, okay, I think I know how to fix it. Hold on a sec, I'll be right there. I'll do this. All right, is this better for anybody? Hopefully this is better. All right. Um, all right, I'm gonna wait a little bit. Let me see if I can, I know there's a bit of a delay between what I experienced here and what was on there. So I apologize. I know I keep trying to make things better and I often just make it worse. So I appreciate the patience. <laughs> um, if you're new again, um, yeah, this again, I would love to hear your thoughts about the process. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, if you draw in a completely different way, that's awesome. We want to hear about that, right? I'm going to talk through my own process and tell you how I'm moving from one decision to the next, um, but you may have an entirely different way of moving through it. And if you do, I would love to hear it. So, okay, so it looks like the synchronization is better now. So hopefully that's uh, going to work. Okay, so let's get to it without any further delay. Um, all right, well, we'll just keep going. I'll try to keep working on this. This is, it's all very frustrating, but I'll figure it out. Okay, paper. I'm working on the Stonehenge uh, white cotton rag paper. That's this stuff right here. 
Um, if any white paper you have will do, um, I, but I prefer this cotton rag paper. I really like the paper that Legion creates. Um, I am working with graphite today, so let me show you what I've got. This is actually going to help. There we go. I have three graphite pencils. I have a 2B, a 6B, and a B. So kind of I have my B as my harder one. I have my 2B as kind of the mid-range and my 6B as my uh, soft one. And then I have this 4B graphite stick. So I'll be working with that in the beginning. For blending, I have my trusty blending, my yeah, trusty blending stump, as well as this new uh, Dynasty brush. It's a large point blend, which has been a lot of fun to experiment with. So I, I kind of play around with both of them. Uh, erasers, I've got three with me today. I'll probably only be using my Derwent retractable eraser and my kneaded eraser, but I really also like this uh, Vanish eraser. It's a nice soft um, one that might lift off a little bit more of those highlights for you. So those are the materials I'll be working with. Um, okay. Let's get to it. Um, there we go. I'm going to clean things off a little bit. So what I have is my small screen in front of me that captures the overhead projection. So I can be looking at that. And I'll be working from the small thumbnail of the, uh, the video. So from the video. And what I want to do is actually I want to get rid of all of this white as much as possible. So I'll be using the side of the, uh, the graphite stick just to start laying in some tone. Um, and one of the reasons I like to begin this way is that it simply is a great way for me to just kind of leave the typing that I've been doing all day behind and kind of engage with the drawing process a little bit more. Um, a very light pressure. You can actually see I'm picking up some of that graphite on my fingertips because my fingertips are kind of actually resisting the weight of the of the. Um, the stick a little bit and then I, I gradually lower it down so it's just kind of floating above the paper and when I use the weight of the the material itself and I'm just moving it side to side it uh, leaves just a really nice soft mark so again I, I'm using this as a way to to simply engage with with the drawing And I want to start building up a tone here. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of thinking about is starting to react to the form in a very gestural way. Uh, and we'll kind of describe what that is if you're not familiar with that term. A gesture is, a, is simply a, and a kind of immediate reaction to the form. Uh, and, you know, we haven't done much to really correct anything. Or we're not focusing too much, but where we are, we're just kind of reacting to the form almost as an abstraction. And from this, we will um, gradually refine it. And my, my hope at the end of this kind of first pass is to build up some value on the page so I'm not, I'm not kind of inhibited by the, the intensity of the white, right? There's so much white on the page. Um, I'm not going to worry about preserving it either. Uh, I'm not going to be able to, once I have something, you know, an area of the paper covered by graphite, I will not be able to, um, I will not be able to fix it. Like I won't be able to get back to that pure white, but I can lift it off to some degree. Um, let me see here. Um, okay, so if anybody also if anybody has any questions, uh, if you type them in all caps, I'm more likely to to see them. So if I miss something, you can start yelling at me in all caps, and I'll I'll try to find it. <laughs> but I do want to get to some of these questions here from Sharon. Um, for a pencil sharpener, I use a simple razor blade. Uh, that's kind of my go-to. Is I simply sharpen it down with a razor blade. So I shave it down this way. Um, I did recently pick up one of these eraser uh, and sharpeners. I mean, um, it's it's this KUM. It's made in Germany, and what it does is a two-step sharpening process. Where the first step 
removes the wood casing. The second step sharpens the core. Um, it's a little bit smaller than I would like, so it takes off a little bit too much, um, and it kind of cuts into the core too much. Um, so I, I want to play around with it a little bit, see if I can make some adjustments. But I, I typically just go with a with a razor blade. That's the easiest. Um, and Michelle's asking, is it worth it to get a graphite stick? I, I think it, it can be helpful. Um, it really does um, build up a nice broad area. But if you sharpen your pencils like this, you see how I have a lot of that that core kind of exposed there, you can also uh, create nice broad marks there. Um, I think for me, it's just the ability to, to use the broad edge of some graphite, you know, whether it's a pencil or whether it's a stick. Um, the, the, the one advantage that I, I do find with the graphite stick is that it, it really does help shift the brain a little bit. Um, so if, for example, if you're trying to break the habit of holding the pencil in this tripod grip and working with line and you're trying to incorporate shape more, then a stick will might be helpful because you can't really, you know, get into the details without working your butt off, right? It, it, it naturally um, lends itself to creating these broad abstract marks. Um, so... And it's one of the reasons I like to work with it in these early stages is that it helps me to think about the subject in broad terms, not in terms of that detail, not getting sucked into that detail too early. I'm going to wipe this down. It's pretty sloppy at this point, but we're going to keep smoothing it out as we go. So I'm not worried about it being, you know, perfect and smooth here. Um... And I'm going to take a few more passes at this uh, with a little bit more attention being paid to the f shapes that will ultimately suggest the iguana. And I'm trying to be precise with my words because I'm trying to remind myself that at this stage, I'm trying not to think about it in terms of iguana. I'm thinking about it in terms of shapes. Okay. Um, as, I, as soon as I start thinking about the subject by its name, you know, at the, as an iguana or if we're drawing an apple, an apple, then one of the risks we run is in using any kind of preconception we have about the subject to inform our drawing. You know, so then we, you know, if I, if I think in my head, uh, you know, what an iguana might look like, that that mental image that is, you know, kind of a construct of the, the verbal definition uh, starts to take over. And so if I'm just thinking about it in terms of shape, general value, things like that, then it helps me to see it more as an abstraction. Uh, so as I make the second layer, one of the things I'm also trying to be mindful of is the, the general direction of the marks. So kind of changing up the direction uh, to, to create very subtle kind of cross hatching in that tone. So now squinting your eyes, blurring your vision. Um, is another really helpful thing to be doing at this stage. So at this point, nothing I'm looking at is in sharp focus. And it is, um, it's all blurry and it's just forms and values. Uh, now, if you do get a, a block of uh, graphite, this has been well used, so it's really kind of smoothed out, and it's got a bit of a camber to it. Uh, so I can lay it down flat, but I've also kind of worked with it. I've been rolling it kind of like this so that if I need to create a kind of a smaller mark, I can just tip it up a little bit, and if I need to, to pivot even more on this edge, I can cr actually create sharp lines. So you can get quite a bit of a variety of marks out of... Um, out of a, a simple block. And now I, I guess I, as I reflect on what is helpful about this graphite stick, um, one of the other things that I find helpful is that I find that 
the block or the stick of graphite lends itself to the way I think when I'm painting a little bit more than if I'm using the point of a pencil. Um, you know, thinking in terms of washes or broad strokes with a flat brush or uh, things like that. So there's a, a kind of a painterly mentality that I'm incorporating into this process um, that you know, may, may not be right for you, but hopefully gives you something to think about. Okay. And as I do this, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on. I'm just kind of doing a light you know, light circular motion over this to blend it in. I'm, I'm not too worried about any of the texture showing up, especially in the center where the uh, iguana will be. The tooth of the paper is going to be helpful in us um, describing that, that texture that, that's really kind of noticeable in the uh, iguana. All right, so this really helps get rid of that white paper. I feel better about that now. I can kind of breathe. Um, because it can get it can get too bright, um, and this will help us uh, to calibrate our understanding of the values a little bit more effectively um, and control the the, sh the the quality of light and shadow. And in particular, as we get to the end, the form. Um, at that, and it's a really good question Michelle has. Do you see the tail as darker or lighter to show it being in the back? Um, when I squint my eyes, what I'm looking for in that in that tail region on this side over here is that subtle relationship between the tail and the background. So if I squint my eyes, it generally falls into um, a, a basic relationship of kind of darker tail shape to lighter ground. But this area here is darker in value than the light here. This is also darker than what we see over here. So there's this gradient plane of light ground to gradually darker into then a real sh dark shift up here that we'll, we'll play around with a bit as well. Um, so now we can kind of, if I keep my eyes squinted, I can start to refine that shape more. And I. this may be a, a good point for you to switch to a pencil, but I feel like this stick is actually working pretty well for what I need now. And I'm simply refining the shape a little bit more, giving a little bit more definition to these dark and light shapes, but still in my mind trying to identify them simply as shapes of dark and light. And then the next step will be to correct these forms. So I'm not, I'm not measuring anything at this point. There will be a stage in which I measure. Uh, this is one of the, those areas, again, where um, you may prefer to do your measuring earlier than I do. I like to get more of the drawing established before I start correcting. The way I view this is as though I'm just putting pieces of the puzzle onto the table. And as I'm gathering information about the subject, the image starts to form. So there's a gradual evolution in the drawing that parallels my understanding of the subject. And so I'm simply reacting to it. This is a good time to use an indirect gaze. So what I mean by that is if you have your reference image adjacent to your drawing, you can fix your gaze on the reference image and make your observations while your hand is moving on the paper adjacent to it. And you can kind of use your peripheral vision to help you guide your marks but you keep your gaze fixed on that reference because that's where the information lies. What happens for me is if I start to put too much attention onto the drawing, then I'm reacting to the shapes on the page, not to the reference image itself. And this is true when you're working from life and it's perhaps even more valuable when you're working from life um, to make sure that you put as much information, much of your attention onto the subject, uh, especially early on and 
and let your marks be a reaction to your observations, not to the drawing itself. Because then what happens is we can kind of get stuck in a feedback loop. Uh, and I, and I've, I've done this many times myself. I've seen that with many students as well is this, this kind of a, you're taking a mental snapshot of the subject and using that to feed a drawing for the next two or three hours and barely looking back at the reference image because you kind of, you can recall that snapshot with a certain amount of confidence, but that image may not actually be as clear as it may feel. Um, so if you need to really force yourself to keep your observations fixed on the subject. I don't know if that's true for any of you or if that resonates in any sort of way that, um, but I'm just kind of speaking from past experience and some of the things that I've had to um, overcome as I've been drawing for the years. All right, so as I'm, as I'm blending now, I can use my paper towel to um, be kind of strategic about how I'm blending by observing these shapes. And so when I'm looking at the paper, ultimately what I'm trying to observe when I'm looking at the paper is, is where I'm at relative to the subject. Am I in generally in the right place? Not does it look right. Now hopefully that makes sense. So I'm trying to be deliberate with the marks. Um, and you can just kind of strike them and make sure I'm generally in the right spot. All right, now let me let me pull out this. Uh, that's the two B. That may be too. This B may be too light, but I'm going to use this. Okay, let me make sure I'm not missing any questions. Uh, All right, it doesn't look like there's any questions, but hello, everybody. If I haven't said hello, hello and welcome. If you're new, welcome. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network. What we do is we draw every day, every Wednesday. Oh, I'd love to draw every day if I had the time. That's a goal, though. If you can draw every day, that's a win. All right, now I need to move into the correction phase. So I there are generally four phases that I like to move through. That's my book right there, See, Think, Draw. That's what... I've kind of put down onto paper as I break down subjects is, is to, to analyze any subject in a certain sequence. You're rolling out a set of decisions to you know, help you understand the subject and use your drawing to better understand the subject and vice versa. First phase is the gesture. You're creating a simple representation of the form. You're getting the information on the page. Now I have something to react to. I can make specific decisions about if the, the placement, the size, the, the angles, the, you know, the proportions, all of those things. I have something very specific to look at and I can say it needs to change in a very specific way. And that's why I prefer to work on the, um, work on the proportions once I've established a rough gesture like this. Um, so right now, uh, Amanda's a question what I'm using. I'm using the B. Now, the I have a bias towards the softer graphite. So the B is about as, as hard as I ever want to go, but that's just for my own purposes because I like smooth, softer, darker graphite. Um, and it's, you may have a different sensibility. I think the, the, the thing that I pay most attention to is uh, just having a range. And I try not to get too kind of picky about them as long as one's generally harder, one's kind of in the middle, and one's softer. So this could be a B, it could be HB, it could be an H. All in that range works for me. And then if I find something in 2, 3, or 4B, great. And then 6, 7, 8B for the soft would be great as well. But um, I rely on pressure control to control the values a lot. Um, and But some of you may prefer 
to rely on the inherent values of each um, each graphite pencil to control those values. And then you can essentially apply a constant pressure throughout your drawing, yet achieve a range of values. All right, now I gotta get my head in the game for measuring. This is a nice kind of a switch in the whole mental structure, right? It, thinking gesturally, thinking abstractly is a very different mindset than thinking in terms of proportions. And so I've gotta kind of shift that a little bit. Um, Peter asks, as I have many books right now, the, that see, think, draw is the first one. Actually, I'll bring it here. Oh, I apologize for that squeak. So this is the, the first book. So that comes out in June. Um, it's available for, for pre-order now, but it um, it's full of projects very similar to what we do here, um, where you're starting with a gesture, you're moving into calculating and measuring, uh, and then you you gradually refine from there. And so you we cover all sorts of uh, fundamental drawing, you know, uh, concepts like proportion and value, like we saw there. Um, but through the creation of these certain projects, and each project then follows a similar structure so that you, um, if you're beginning, you kind of have a, a framework for navigating through any subject if, um, that you are compelled to draw. All right. Where am I going to? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this front leg kind of as the anchor. And my first, my first step is going to be to uh, work with some angle sighting. So what that is, is breaking down the form into simple angles. Right now, I'm simply observing the angle and estimating what it, you know, how it might be placed on the page. Uh, for greater precision, though, what you might do is if you have your reference image in front of you, close one eye so that it flattens your depth perception. So when you hold your pencil out in front of you, it feels like it's placed directly on top of your reference. This is true for if you're drawing from life or a photograph. Uh, you identify that angle, so you align this your pencil with your targeted um, area on your drawing, find the angle, and then carry it, place it directly on top of your drawing. So what I'm seeing in front of me here is doing that. I'm looking at the reference image, and I'm carrying it on top of my drawing that the overhead camera is catching. And then I can kind of estimate this angle for the slope of the back. And I'm using an overhand grip like this intentionally. It makes things lighter. Oh, hey, Jeff. <laughs> I'm in my live stream now, but hey, yeah. Guys. Okay. <laughs> Jeff says hello. <laughs> um, and so what, you, uh, what you're doing is using the side of the pencil to create a, a soft and broad mark. And you, with the side of the pencil, what it does is it, it tends to float on the surface of the paper a little bit more than if you were to use the tip of the pencil, which kind of embosses the page. And you might find that it's harder to lift a mark that's made with an overhand grip. So that's why I like the, uh, I mean, with a tripod grip, it's harder to erase the tripod grip marks. Easier with the overhand grip. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, so that requires a bit more drawing from the shoulder, from the arm, or at least it inspires uh, drawing from the, the full arm. And the other reason I like to do this measuring portion after I've built up some sort of tone on the paper is that you can see it's a little bit more gentle, right? So I can work these marks into the form a little bit more easily. I've kind of seasoned the paper so it's a little bit more receptive to subsequent layers of graphite and a little bit more receptive to those layers blending together. Uh, so now I can move to other areas. So if, you're, if I'm working on, say, this back leg, I can estimate that angle, but another th key thing that I need to look at now is where it is in relation to other forms in the iguana. So right now what I'm using is what's called a horizontal guide. I can, I can take a horizontal line, if I'm measuring the top of that back leg and I carry a horizontal line across there, I can see where it intersects those lines that will be the leg. And what I notice is right now, those marks really intersect at where I've placed that, um, that elbow. But when I compare that to the reference image, it should intersect up here. So I've got something to figure out here. 
um, either I need to move this back end up or I need to bring this down. And I think since I have so much room up here, what I'll do is I'll move that up a little bit more. So if I give myself a little bit more information on this elbow and set this as my anchor, then I know that that back leg is going to be somewhere in line with approximately that area. So you can see what a difference that made. Um, and this can be really helpful sometimes um, if you kind of contemplate the fact that I reacted to the placement of this back leg purely on instinct. And it felt right to me, right? But it's not quite right compared to what I'm looking at. Uh, and you are going to be in control of the accuracy on your drawing. How, how precise do you want to be? How important is it that you get those proportions right? Um, this step, if I, if I need to, I can lightly erase some of these older marks just so that I can see more clearly that line. And now I can move up here to this tail. And one of the things I observe as I angle sight is that, you know, there's a feeling that that tail kind of sticks up at an angle out of the back. But it actually, at that intersection point, it's a horizontal line. And you can break that tail down into kind of a couple angles. Uh, oh, Sharon has a good question too. Do you usually draw on a flat surface or use an easel? I, for the purposes of the show, I've been drawing on a flat surface. And so now most of my drawing is done on a flat surface because this is where I get most of my drawing done. Um, for my painting, however, I, uh, work at an easel, and there are certain um, stages there where I'll, I'll do some drawing on the easel. Uh, I think if you know, I think it's perhaps um, I think it's a really good uh, opportunity to practice drawing with your arm by working at an easel, uh, and especially if you feel like you're having a hard time kind of breaking the habit of drawing with the wrist and the fingertips, then an easel will be a great way to help with that. And, um, but, uh, you know, I think, again, it ends up coming down to what, what works for you. I find an easel just a bit more freeing in terms of expressivity with the marks. Um, but you might sacrifice a little bit of control unless you have something like a mall stick to rest your hand on. Uh, but I tend to deprioritize detail in my drawing over kind of expression. All right, so now I've got a I've got a landmark here that turned from the around the crown of the head where it starts to level off. I'm going to use that as a landmark, and I'm going to drop a plumb line down there. A plumb line is simply a vertical mark that you can visualize that cuts through the rest of the form. So from that turn on the head, if I place that here, I can run a vertical line down through there, and I can see how does that relate to where the eye is going to be, where the circular thing on the chin, <laughs> the neck is, um, how it relates to this leg here. And what I see in the reference photo is that that turn right here should be generally in line with the right side of this leg here. Now, it, it does come to, to mind the idea of you know, drawing from life or drawing from a photograph. You know, for the show, we work from photographs because that's the easiest way for us to do this together online live. If you can work from life, that's going to give you even more opportunities to develop your skills because then you're confronting all the issues related to taking a three-dimensional object and translating it into two dimensions. 
Having said that, you know, working from a photograph, there's still a lot of things that we can learn. And there are a lot of processes that we can use to help us when we're working from life. So hopefully these processes like angle sighting, comparative measuring, plumb lines and horizontal guides, those are all tools that you can use when working from life. And if you close one eye, that's really the trick. That flattens your depth perception. So it, it helps you to see the subject as a set of abstract shapes and forms. It helps to, to lose that sense of space. Now, the challenge that I'm, I'm faced here is because we're working with a two-dimensional image. Uh, I don't know. I need to... I need to shut off my Wi-Fi, I think, before I do <laughs> these live streams. Um, so the again, I just want to kind of bring that up because if you do have the opportunity to work from life, it will um, give you some really good opportunities. And especially if you're working with wildlife, then you're also confronted with speed and pace of your observations. Um, I've been really contemplating um, that a lot, and I'll talk a bit more about that, but I do want to get to some of these questions. Dallas is saying, how long have I been drawing like this? This process, well, it's been, a, it's been an evolution of my process, but I've been drawing with intention for 25 years, a little bit longer than 25 years. And over those 25 years... Um, I've come to understand the drawing process um, in a variety of ways and have just kind of settled on this way of thinking about it. Um, all right, I need to get that overall angle right here. I'm going to turn off the, the focus there. It should be manually focus. That way I won't focus on my hand anymore. Um, and then this, I, I want to I think of what I'm going to do is just break this part of the iguana down to a kind of a single form. So I've actually kind of stepped back a little bit in terms of detail. Uh, so here I'm going to kind of, I need to pull that front part out a little bit more. So now I've kind of broken this neck area down into one, two, you know, three angles into that leg. And so there's this turn on that lower, that back leg there, the back front leg. And what I'm doing is visually I'm just checking in to see where I am relative to this part of the body. So that becomes another thing that it, it becomes second nature after a while. You find yourself making marks, but as you're doing that, you're doing quick check-ins to see where you are relative to other aspects of the form. So as I make this line, I'll do a quick mental um, check-in to see if where that aligns vertically as a plumb line to the rest of the figure. Um, as I work, say, on some of these marks here on the neck, I can do a check-in to see where I am horizontally compared to that tail. Uh, so you're, you're really bouncing around the whole drawing in, in, the, in the process that I'm working with. So rather than kind of finishing in one area, moving to the next and moving to the next, I'm building everything all up at once, and I'm trying to make connections between various elements. Um, and now back to kind of gesture drawing, because this really relates to detail. And we talked about gesture, and we looked at gesture in these early stages of the drawing. And we, we now we understand gesture from a large kind of scale understanding. Uh, what I want to kind of propose and see if this is helpful to anybody, is to think about think about the idea that just uh, all drawing is gesture drawing. That's essentially the way I like to think about it. Every 
mark you make has the opportunity to become a to become a gesture that defines something, whether it's defining the entirety of that form or whether it's defining a simple kind of fine detail. Try to think about those marks as a gesture of that thing. You're reacting to that form, right? Um, and I think that will be really helpful as we move into um, the kind of the more refined areas of the drawing and we want to try to suggest some of that uh, some of that texture and, and really cool um, kind of detail of the of this iguana okay let's see I think there was a um, and Edie is saying, yes, this is a graphite stick here. This is a 4B, and it actually came out. This is, if you're, if you're really not sure what to get, this General's Drawing Kit is a great one, and it comes in that kit. It gives you charcoal. It gives you graphite. It gives you everything you need, really, um, and it comes with these sticks uh, that I find really useful. Okay. Now, I've kind of mapped out the form with greater precision. Now I can start it to move into a refinement stage. Oh, I was just looking for my paper towel, the one that's in my hand. <laughs> Before I start to kind of erase any lines, I don't actually generally kind of erase out any of my guidelines. I'm going to leave them on there because you never know when actually one of these marks will be helpful in describing something later on. I think a lot of what we're going to be playing with as we um, as we contemplate using the power of suggestion to describe this form um, is is really just observing what is what is happening on the page. What are some happy accidents that we can be using to our advantage? Uh, at this stage, I can kind of start to smooth things out a little bit in the background, but I'll come back to that. So uh, kind of a quick tip, if you're looking at a, a, an area like this, see how it's really blotchy? I'm going to target the lighter spots in between the darker blotches with a, this overhand grip, changing up the direction of my mark. So I'm doing kind of circular marks and hatches and figure eights, all sorts of marks start to fill that in a little bit more in those light areas. And then take a pass with the paper towel. And I, I generally start with a light pressure. And if I need, if I, you know, if I see an area that's light like this one and I need to, to darken it a little bit, a little bit I, can, I can try burnishing that a little bit more. All right. And I don't think I need it to be super smooth back there. I can clean that up later if I need to. So what do I want to do now? I think the next stage I'm going to move on to, so I'll move into like my medium graphite. So this is my 2B. Um, and I have a larger... Um, I have a, a larger scale reference over here on the left that will give me a little bit more information. So if I were to focus kind of purely on this, the front end of the iguana, I can move through and start to refine that a little bit. Now, you can see that I'm taking this in stabs so just like we, we were bouncing all over the place when we were focusing on the larger form, I'm going to be doing that on a kind of a smaller region. So now I'm thinking about this area here, and then I'll move down to this area. Um, but I'm not, um, I'm not moving from spot to spot to spot. I'm bouncing left and right and doing some quick check-ins, again, with where I'm at relative to other features in that uh, section. Go use this overhand grip. Uh, 
Uh, now, one of the things that you can start to do as well is uh, start to make observations about the overall texture. So for example, in here, we have this kind of main, uh, and I'm observing all these spikes, but rather than getting in there and, and getting overwhelmed by all the individual spikes, I'm thinking about generally what, what direction are they flowing in, and then allowing the pencil to move in that direction. Now I'm going to cut back across here, see where I am relative to some of these shadow forms. Ugh. Let me, hold on here, I need to, can I do that? Crap. People keep calling and I'm on my phone. <laughs> oh no, I messed it up. There we go. I just adjusted the exposure of my camera there too much. People want to talk all day today, huh? Um, it's a good busy day here at the office here at Artist Network, so. Okay, back to this. So again, thinking about this region, I'm gonna come across here. And think about those forms. Now I'm confronted with this area here that, what did my needed eraser go? Ah, I dropped it. I'll do some subtractive drawing here. So when I'm using the eraser, it's not just a way to clean up mistakes. I'm trying to use it as a mark-making tool to describe structures. All right, and as I'm doing that, I'm applying all the same decisions that I was making earlier to this subject. So it's, um, you know, I'm looking across the form here. I'm doing check-ins to see where I am relative to other forms. And I'm trying to estimate kind of what shape I need to describe and what direction you need to make those marks. And the kneaded eraser I like because it's a little bit gentle. It's not, it doesn't lift off as much as the rubber erasers will later on. How are we doing on time? We're only about 45 minutes into the drawing, and this will run about two hours. Let's see what happens if I just kind of generally lighten that area. And I'm still keeping my eyes blurred, so even when I'm, you can see when I'm squinting, but sometimes even when I'm not squinting, I, I'm just letting my, my gaze relax. Uh, one of the reasons I like to do that too is that I don't have to look at myself as, as well. Because <laughs> I'm looking at myself on the screen and it's really disconcerting. I, it's distracting. And so if I let my gaze kind of soften, then, then I just become this blurry shape in the corner. Okay, so now I'm kind of doing some subtractive drawing to... Uh, start to define some of these forms here, defining the light and shadow shapes. Um, let's see, and then here, I can refine that a little bit farther. So let's go into that. I'm gonna move into the B here. Um, now, I'd love to hear from you all I don't know, what drawing kind of brings into your life? What compels you to draw? It's one of those things that we, I think we sometimes kind of take for granted that we may all be entering into this strange compulsion for the same reasons. But when I, when I talk with people, we, I find that we're often motivated you know, from, we're all coming from different places. Um, let's see, did you, any other, oh, let's see, Edie's saying, I once read that graphite is soluble in turpentine. Do you know if that's true? I, that would make sense. I've, that's my experience uh, when painting. I'll often um, 
on a on a blank canvas or panel, you know, sketch in some compositions and kind of think through some initial ideas. And then when I come in with a brush that's loaded with turpentine and pigment, it'll it'll break up from there. Sometimes it'll lift off altogether if I'm really scrubbing pretty hard. So I, I do think it would probably um, become soluble in the graphite. I mean, with with turpentine, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, Leslie say mental health therapy and desire to create. Yes, I would say for me, that's generally where where it emerges as well. There's something about observational drawing that connected with me. The idea of just simply looking and reacting to the form and becoming kind of more keen observers. I mean, that's what really connected with me. And so me, for me, it's more about the observations than the, the actual uh, finished piece. It's more about that experience of drawing. This is incorrect. That might have to come up. I keep playing around with that. So as I'm moving through, so as I'm, let's say, looking at this, um, I, I have very limited information about the bi bi uh, biology of iguanas. So this spiky wattle thing <laughs> is, as I'm looking at it, uh, I, th I find it generally effective to start in the center of this form and work my way out to find the the more specific uh, kind of shape and refine that edge. And then kind of moving back and forth to find that edge rather than scribing a line and then filling it in. Uh, and that's generally my process because I found it challenging to confront that line later if I was too heavy-handed with the line and the, along the contour. And what would, will really um, kind of inspire that sense of realism is to try to get rid of lines. Because lines don't exist in nature. Contour lines don't exist in nature. Uh, what a contour line is, is a, it's a line that we use to represent the edge of a three-dimensional object. So edges exist, but the actual line itself that we often kind of naturally are inclined to use doesn't actually exist. Um, and I want to make sure I'm clear in saying that, you know, the goal isn't just to get rid of lines, but if your goal is to become, uh, to create work that has a greater sense of light and kind of realism, you might consider getting rid of some of those lines and in this drawing here, we'll actually be using lines strategically to define edges in hopefully a way that um, also suggests the, I don't know, the, the, the realism of it. So let's see. I want to really understand this shadow shape. Now, shadow shapes are really helpful things to observe. And what they are is that in this case, we're dealing with a form shadow. We have the iguana that goes from light into shadow. That shadow crosses many forms. We can see a distinct change in the texture underneath, kind of inside that shadow shape. But if you squint your eyes and you get rid of all of that texture, you can see a, a more distinct kind of triangular shadow here. We see a shadow here that kind of catches on its lip that kind of merges with this shadow off to the right. We see an overall shadow shape for the eye as well. And I think it's really helpful to prioritize that shadow shape before we engage with any sort of texture or detail because it will lead to visual confusion if that texture and detail is not mapped to the form of the subject, it'll kind of pop off the surface as decoration, not, um, not an integrated part of that form. And it's really essential, you know, again, as we discuss the power of suggestion and drawing, it's really essential that we think that way because focusing on the structure of light and shadow 
is a huge signal to the viewer that uh, that triggers their brain to fill in missing information. That's the suggestion right there. It's that understanding of light and shadow. So for example, at this stage, the transition, the gradient between light and shadow is an important one that that becomes one big clue that our brain will be using to start filling in information. If it's a very sharp transition, then it starts to become a smoother object and it's kind of shinier, more reflective. The more diffused that transition, the more matte or bumpy that surface is going to be. Uh, so um, thinking about those general transitions is really helpful. So if you look down at this section, for example, you can see variations of light and shadow. This is generally in light, this is in shadow, but you can barely even make out where that actual line is as such a smooth transition. Uh, and that in itself is, a, is really helpful in suggesting texture. So now, um, what I'm actually gonna do now is shift to focusing on what's called the line of termination. Line of termination is the point at which the form moves from being in light to in being in shadow. So we have a light side, shadow side, and then somewhere along there is the line of termination. Uh, and it's not a sharp line in this case, because it's a very bumpy and rounded object. But if you squint your eyes, you can start to see it. And I'm going to try to map that line across the many uh, and varied textural forms here. Again, squinting your eyes, blurring your vision helps to see that. So where I had an established a general axis this way before, now I'm becoming more specific with it. And I'm using this overhand grip. Now this, this pencil tip ha has a bit of a camber as well. So I'm actually making contact with the pencil kind of inset from the tip. And what that does is it allows for that soft edge. If I need a sharper edge, I just simply roll my hand up and I engage the tip a little bit more. I don't need that for this edge because it's a very soft gradient. So again, I'm using, allowing the tools to do some of the work for me. Now this is all in shadow here. I'm going to erase out that light part in a little bit. And I think what I want to do now is just kind of drop in whatever kind of dark circle, circular form this thing is here. Just to, just to start to reinforce that illusion of light and shadow. I think I need to even pull more off of more off of this. That a kneaded eraser didn't do a whole lot. Okay. Uh, now I'm gonna I'll keep drawing with this eraser because it's fun. Very light touch, just kind of skipping across the surface, using it really only in the light side of that edge, of this form, I mean. And I can use this to kind of refine this shape of the leg. And this is really a, there's, I'm thinking about this more like a brush than anything. So let me take that off. So you can see I can create a fine line if I run it along this way along the edge, and I can also drag it up and around that form, and that starts to suggest that form and volume. I can roll it onto its corner and create a sharp edge just like a, a flat brush would if you were, say, oil painting or watercolor painting. And this is all, I find this all really helpful for when, when I'm actually painting. This helps to build a certain amount of muscle memory, hand-eye coordination, etc. I'm going to kind of move back up into here, and maybe what I'll do is um, 
kind of break this down even farther. I'm just going to focus on some of those light forms. And I'm paying attention to the edges here. So again, I'm kind of just like with a pencil, rolling it on its edge to create a sharper edge, kind of leaning back on it, flattening it out to create a softer gradation. Uh, and starting with a really light pressure, leaning in on it more as I need more, uh, more to lift off the page. So light there, and then I really like this light on the um, kind of the eyebrow there. Now I'm being very intentional with this edge. I, this is a really critical edge. We'll focus a lot on that as we go, but um, I, it's, I'm trying to initiate that, that whole top of the head by putting together a bunch of broken shapes rather than starting with a line that is all unified. I'm trying to piece these 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 dark and light shapes together. And the hope there is that it will um, it will read as more three dimensional than um, than a line might suggest. This is that vanish eraser that Jerry sells. I love this thing. It's really a nice soft eraser that lifts beautifully. Now it's not. Um, you know, super great for precise details because it is softer, but you can actually get quite a bit done with it and then maybe use this, your, like if I have my Derwent retractable eraser that I'll use for finer details or the Tombow Mono Zero, which is a great eraser too. So just going through and looking for uh, areas that I can kind of lift with my eraser. And again, I'm thinking more like a brush with this, so dragging across it. And then if you can, even start to kind of sculpt the form. Any chance you can get to explore the cross contour of the subject, I think will be helpful. So imagine, you know, you're you're dragging this up and over around the form, and it will um, it will help you to to understand what direction to make your marks. There's a kind of little ridge here along that that belly. Um, thank you all for contributing. What um, what your motivations to draw are. I see relax and chill, expanding creative mind, desire to create something worthwhile to do. Um, yeah. And I see a lot of stuff going on. I, I, need, I really wish I had more time to read all what's happening in this <laughs> about the solvents and such. So I'll have to check back. So all of the live chat goes up in the recording as well. So thank you all for sharing that. But um, all right, now I'm going to kind of bounce around. I for me, I think find it really helpful to not get stuck in one area because uh, that's where I actually become less effective as an observer. The more we look at something, the more it gets distorted in our mind. Um, so here with the eraser, I can use the full width of it to lift off some of that. And it's just this light pressure gradually getting harder and harder. And as I encroach the edge of the leg here, I can refine that shape a bit. Really nice negative space here where that foot is in shadow against that light ground there. And I will grab my 2B pencil kind of calculate where that back leg projects out. And I'm just going to use the side of the pencil to kind of scribe this gesture in there. Just a really subtle shadow under there. 
I'll kind of come back to that, but I want to place that and not forget it. Um, back to this area. Now this is this edge here is soft where you have a shadow. Edges are really important. Um, they're they're things that our our brain relies on to interpret form. It also it is a it's how we control focus in the drawing where we draw people's attention is where we're um, we're controlling that contrast between sharp and soft edges. Lost and found edges is another term that you may hear. And so I'm going to, when I keep using this block, I'm almost thinking about it as though it's a piece of white, like chalk or something that I'm drawing with. And just switching to my left hand so I can see this right edge a little bit better. And try to you know try to hold that shape in your mind. Go slow, go deliberate, go deliberately. And I'm gonna switch back to the this is the 2B. And now we have got we've got this really complicated form of these claws and the fingers there essentially. Uh, now this it could be helpful when drawing human fingers as well. This this process give you something to really think about. But the 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 way I try to tackle these more complex forms is to rely on that the abstraction of it all. The way we tackled the initial phase of this drawing by thinking about it as an abstraction. I try to do that with the hands itself. Um, they they are, um, you know, there there are areas that are easily filled in by the viewer's mind. You know, the classic example if you is if you look at like most cartoon figures, they have four fingers instead of five, and why? Because we don't count them, right? We're looking that at them gesturally. And often the most effective renderings of hands can be just quick gestures. And so what you may end up doing as part of your process is um, rather than keep hammering away at, at one hand, maybe work with it as a gesture. If I don't like that, I can wipe it out and try it again, right? Maybe I'll try it with uh, by, by looking at the light shapes rather than the dark shapes. And so rather than um, kind of essentially overworking it, I'm trying it multiple times and trying to get that gesture right in a way that the viewer will accept it um, and fill in that missing information. So now I have that light shape. What happens if I draw this dark shape, squinting my eyes so that I can see it as an abstraction? And not trying to think about it any more than that. You know, this isn't an anatomical study, but you can learn a, not a lot about the anatomy of a of a subject by drawing it, even if you don't have names associated with each of these forms or even understand, you know, basic muscle structure and things like that. If you just think, focus on shapes, the direction of your marks is a key thing. What direction do you need to make your mark? Okay. 
And then here, for example, as I look at these, these kind of knuckles behind there, I'm just trying to think about it as a kind of a dark crescent shape that's connected to this foreground shape in a particular way, right? Um, can refine that a little bit more. Okay, lollipop strawberry is no worries if you're late. Um, Heather is saying, uh, I think for me drawing has been something I have done since my earliest childhood, so it's just such a natural thing for me. Um, it's also something that you shared with your dad, which is awesome. That's that's the best thing. If you can, I, I you get a lot of questions uh, from people asking, you know what. What should I do to support my child, whatever age they are? And I think the best thing you can do, the first thing that needs to be done is just simply draw with them and make it a safe place to do that um, and establish this idea of just practicing and doing it and, and essentially you know, putting some intention into it. So I just use the side of the eraser as a wedge to pull out that, that highlight. So now you can see the rest of this shadow shape has not been really clearly defined. Now we got this little um, kind of sky hole there. There is a certain amount of kind of importance that we need to put on that little hole because it's surrounded by all those darks. If I create a sharply defined and bright kind of white rectangle, it's going to pop to the surface. To make it feel and believable as though it's a simple gap in the shadow that's cast on the ground, I have to pay attention to the edges, how it's a diffused edge down in here. It's this sharp edge here. It's a sharp edge here. And then it's diffused again back in here. And what that does, even though it's very subtle, it's a really helpful thing to help define that sense of, of space the spatial relationships between things. So then we kind of accept it as though this uh, right in here is a bit of that back leg. I didn't place that highlight quite properly. I need to move that a little bit to the right. So I'm going to just kind of smooth that out. If I look down from here relative to the edge of that leg, I need to bring it in right about here. And I overstated that. That's fine. There's too much of it. Now I can go in and refine it. And again, look at that, the where you have sharp edges and where you have diffused edges. So it's a sharp edge along here. And then it's diffused right along in here. So I'm gonna, I can kind of work that edge a little bit with the, the pencil with these circular motions. Now I can come back in here and create a little bit more of that fold. Now there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in the shadow area, um, but I'm mostly just kind of giving indications of where these forms need to be. Okay. I gotta keep checking here like this. I need to make more steep. I didn't quite get that angle right. Uh, so you can always you always have an opportunity to adjust proportions. All right. I'm going to use this blending brush a little bit. See how this works. So just a light touch on this. See what it does. It's a really good way to going to soften things a little bit. And I'll actually use that. Actually, I'm not quite ready. I'm going to use the blending stump in a little bit. Uh, I do want to see if there's any questions. Let's see. Um, uh, what kind of pencils and paper are you using? Eraser. So this is the, if you're new, 
Stonehenge white. This is a cotton rag paper. I love it. It's fantastic stuff. And then I'm using, these are the Cezanne pencils that the, the, the labels have been rubbed off, but they, use, they sell them at Jerry's. I love them. They're really nice and soft. So I have a B, a 2B, and a 6B. I've got my standard rubber erasers. I got the Vanish eraser plus the, the Derwent retractable one. Um, a block of charcoal, I mean, block of graphite. Oh, that would have messed people up in my needed eraser. So there is a link or in the in the description below. You'll find the list of materials that I've got. Um, all right. So we're about a, an hour and a quarter in. We're going to keep going. I'm having a lot of fun. So I'm kind of taking my time here. This initial sketch I did quite a bit faster um, just because I was kind of limited on time. I, accident, I don't know, quite a bit faster, but I did it faster. So um, I wasn't talking quite as much. All right, so I'm just thinking about areas where I need to sharpen the edges a little bit more. So right in here, for example, is a sharp edge. I can can refine this form a little bit. Here we have a relatively light edge, so I can drag my eraser along there to kind of define that. But I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do along this to create that gradient, I'm gonna use the side of the eraser, so use that back corner to create that sharp edge, but kind of lay it almost flat. Just I'm just kind of leaning a little bit into that edge And it it picks up and creates that turning edge there. So it's scraping along the side here, and it's creating that nice soft gradient. Um, now let's see, where does this... Something I feel like, I can need to move this in. Let's see. All right, so doing some measuring here, if I, if I accept this head as the proper dimension, I can use that to compare to that space and to that space. So it looks like it's actually correct. Um, I think what I've done here is I've drawn this back leg too flat. So maybe come down, I think I need to come down, I think I erased it off a little bit too much. So I'm kind of, I'm happy with the, the edge of that, that top edge there. Let me have that shadow. So that kind of rolling edge that I did earlier with the eraser, I'm doing that with a pencil as well. I'm laying it flat, um, and you can see that it's creating this softer edge, that softer gradient. And I can do that with this shadow form. So I'm actually going to create that shadow. I'm doing just these quick kind of vertical Marks, I don't want a hard edge. I want something really soft for that tail. Um, all right, now I think what I'll do is actually I'll work from the background forward. Um, right now, this tail seems to kind of be sticking out a little bit. And the reason it's doing that is that this relationship between this ground here, that line, and this value here is staying the same as we move from foreground to background. So I need to create some more variation. Uh, and one way to do that is to kind of lighten this ground a little bit more. Actually, maybe I'll use the kneaded eraser here. And it being kind of gravel, I can be a little loose with it. So now we have some change there that's happening. 
um, and I can carry some of that down into here as well. And just create a softer gradation. And, and now we can work on those stripes a little bit. Um, I think what I'll do is you know, there's actually a, a distinct angle in these things, so be careful not to create a series of kind of loops. You can see a, kind of a vertical plane Uh, now, as I'm doing this, you can see that this pencil tip is highly irregular. Let me see if I can, if it'll focus on that. Come on. It's not wanting, wanting to do it. There we go. Um, crap, it's not doing it. There. But you can see how it's irregular. It's got that sharp point, but it's got all these bumps and stuff to it. So as I lay it down flat, there's an irregularity to those marks. It's not a clean brush stroke. It is, um, it's creating this irregularity, and that's really helpful for creating things essentially that are out of focus. I don't want to draw a lot of attention by making this highly rendered at this point. I want to start with it being kind of loosely rendered. So now that I've added some of those stripes, that also breaks up that edge. And I can do that even more by lifting um, some of these lighter spots. I'm just tapping with the eraser. And so again, the hope is that this is going to suggest things more than really define them. And if you do want more precision here, the next step you can do, let's see if I, if I lift off a little bit more of the light areas between, you can come back in with a more precise mark like that to kind of create a, a sharper edge. But I'm, I started that edge, I started these darker bands by putting in some more regular marks. And so now I'm just kind of playing with those variations there. And then what defines really the edge here is that contrast between those vertical marks here and that horizontal erased edge on the, uh, the leg there. I'm going to suggest that claw. Well, this is a wonky one here. This does bring me back to my... Um, High school art days, one of the early drawings that I was really proud of was a drawing of an iguana. We had a, we were able to get a live one in Miss Crabtree's class. All right, I'm just erase out a little bit of a highlight. So I'm not being really careful at all. Um, and, and I feel like there's something that happens in the viewer's mind when you know, we recognize that the artist has made an intentional choice to not be precise with the marks. It's like the brain says, all right, now i got to work a little bit harder. I'm ready for it. Um, if you get caught in the middle where there's a lot of information, it's, it's highly detailed and precise, but it's not quite accurate, then the brain doesn't quite know what to do with that. You know, which, which, what to trust, essentially. Do I trust my observations or do I trust the marks that the artist has made with intention? And uh, the other thing I'm calculating now is that I, this is not the darkest graphite that I have. I'm going to preserve the darkest darks for more of this foreground area. But I can use pressure here to get some darker marks. Uh, now, what's kind of cool is you can see these distinct um, kind of ribs in the legs. Uh, if you want to, you can kind of count each one out and make sure you have all of them. 
accounted for properly, but I'm not going to do that because that makes me a little claustrophobic to think about. Um, so what I'm thinking about here as I suggest that, I'm trying to visualize the path. And then as I, and you can see my pencil lead is aligned with that path. And as I move along it, I'm making these short vertical kind of ticks. And they're all very irregular. Um, but it suggests those vertical lines kind of effectively. And what I'm trying to pay attention to is how those paths curve and bend around the space. So these are largely horizontal down here, but as we move up to the top of that leg, they really start to wrap around um, and they make almost this crisscrossing pattern here. So very lightly, I'll kind of go into that. Maybe if you need to sharpen it up a little bit more, you can drop in a little bit more information, you know, kind of drop a line in there to sharpen it up. And as this leg kind of wraps into that shadow, it's wrapping around and those lines are getting closer and closer together. And now the other thing I can do is now that I have those dark marks there, I can use the corner of the eraser to lift out kind of highlights along those ridges kind of between them. So I'm just kind of tapping along that path. So very quickly, kind of suggesting some of that detail. Um, all right, welcome everybody. If you're new, I want to welcome you. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network. My name's Scott Meyer, and we're all drawing this iguana because it's a lot of fun, and it helps us to really understand um, how to use the power of suggestion to suggest detail rather than getting caught up in refining all of them. Or if you do like getting caught up in all the details, because that can be very um, compelling, I think, you know, and satisfying, then what you would do is you would kind of stay at this stage and you go in there with even finer detail and start to render each and every one of those little bumps. Um, but I'm going to stop here for that. Now, one area that I find is easy over, easily overlooked but um, very important is this transition from the tail over the leg into that, that, that kind of the body. So he's or she is moving away from us. There's a distinct angle. We're, he, there's more of an angle away from us than the, kind of that broadside. There is a subtle kind of curve right here over that leg that kind of reveals that depth a bit more effectively. And you can start to see this pattern as it transitions from the stripes along the tail up that, up that body. And so that information right in along here is really helpful. Um, and what you're trying to think about is squishing all that information into a very fine, um, kind of small, narrow section of that, um, of that body. And now as we move up this, it's also, it not only is it moving away from us, but there's also kind of a rounded quality this way. And you can see three distinct black bands. Uh, now I'm gonna use the same technique as I did over here, but for those bands. And this one is really close to that edge because it's kind of wrapping up around that side. Uh, in this case, I'm actually holding it this direction, but kind of scribing downward. And then as we come around, there's this other stripe here. And again, that, that irregular shape to the uh, pencil is really helpful. So I'm trying to visualize that path and really wrapping around that cross contour of the, of the form. And if you're not familiar with that term cross contour, what I'm talking about is we, we described contour marks earlier as, as defining the three-dimensional edge of an object or the edge of a three-dimensional object. Cross contour marks are ones that you use inside those contour edges to re reinforce that form. 
So, you know, if I go like this, if I make a mark that goes like this, that looks totally out of place because we're starting to understand this as a three-dimensional form that has volume this way. Uh, and we know that these marks follow up and they have a logic to them. This one runs counter to that logic. So now we're trying to figure out what that mark is. So let me get rid of that. And I'll drop this other one. And now if you look at the spacing, this is closer to that edge. There's a bit of a gap here, and then this gap is even larger. I'm going to pay attention to where it intersects that this leg here. And that kind of runs up vertically there. And those three marks really help to define that, that edge. So um, now as we move here, you know, one of the things you can start to do is try to really try to visualize marks that follow along that cross contour. What is that form doing? Um, there is a kind of a, a hatching pattern that you see. So I might change the direction of my marks here. And try to suggest you know, some of these light and dark areas here. A lot of this is just achieved through kind of tapping on the page. Um, so sorry, this is requiring a little bit more focus. So what I'm looking at is kind of the pattern in the scales. What direction are those marks running in? Let me see if I can zoom in. So you can see a little bit more clearly. And it changes as you follow along that body. So they start to kind of round out towards the bottom. And I'm not, again, I'm not kind of measuring or calculating, I'm just making general observations about the direction of things. And using the side of the pencil, I'm, I'm kind of just doing these quick, short edges. And they're, it's a sh sharp edge because the, the edge of the cylindrical form of the graphite is, is sharp. And I'm rolling the pencil in my fingers as I go so that I always have a kind of a fresh section of graphite. No, so I'm looking at some of the pattern in here, kind of quickly reacting to it. Let me zoom out a little bit more. So hopefully that makes sense because it's hard to really see what's happening in there. Uh, now what I can do is use this. I'm actually going to sharpen my eraser again. My This is my retractable eraser. Sharpen that so that I get a nice sharp point. And, and I can use the eraser in the same way to lift off some of those areas where the highlights are a little bit stronger. So if we zoom out even farther, hopefully what that does is it accumulates together to suggest some of that texture. All right, and now we kind of keep working around the form, doing that same kind of approach. Now the thing that, the area that is going to be really kind of most important are the, the transition areas. 
Um, so actually, I'm going to, if I move down to this elbow, so the same kind of approach that I was using on that leg here, I'm going to use on this, kind of prioritizing these kind of vertically oriented marks. Um, but then there's also kind of a crisscross pattern here. But try to be as specific as you can with the angle of those marks. If they're really kind of rigid and horizontal and, and perpendicular marks, um, it could work against you. But if you're really focusing on that cross contour, what direction they're running in, it, um, it can be helpful. So um, here is where I want to spend a little bit more time It's that transition from light into shadow. You can see I'm just placing the eraser, kind of squiggling it a little bit. It's a very precise term. And then around the rest of the form, I can be a little less precise. Now, and now we, if we think back to the episode with the vases, you know, the black paper, we were working with the vases and, and we talked a lot about turning edges. We're trying to think about that here as well, really wrapping those lines around that edge into the form. And so now I can, I can work this as well. There's, there's some... Really interesting marks here. Again, this is a cylindrical form, so the art marks open up a little bit more at the, the kind of the apex of that term, turn, and, and then they get closer and closer as they wrap around into there. And again, there's kind of this kind of crisscross pattern, but I'm not being super careful. I'm more, again, just using the side of the pencil to suggest that And I try not to overthink the marks and instead just kind of react to it. If it doesn't work, I can always fix it. And I'd rather just take a few marks, move on, change the pattern up, than get really stuck in a in a kind of a rhythmic kind of mark making approach. So here I'm just using the corner of the eraser because you get these larger um, scales there. Again, power of suggestion as much as we can. Now now, so the hand, this, the claws, the fingers, whatever they are, you know, this is a plane that's leading away. And we're looking across the surface of it. Uh, right now, it's all very flat and clumsy. So what I can do is I can sharpen these kind of front claws a little bit. That'll help bring them forward. And a few key areas just bring a little bit more depth. Um, but what's really going to help is in this area, how I manage these marks in this area will say a lot. You know, if I go like this, right, it, it's kind of flat, you know, it's just creating like this flat wall. It's not doing a lot to create the depth. So let me erase those out. So instead, you know, what I'm seeing is like this radiating kind of pattern here. And there's this kind of sense that, again, we're looking across it, so we're, we get these marks that are all very tightly packed in along that surface. And then we have some subtle rounded marks here for this 
this claw. So what I'm thinking is, again, just kind of lightly just kind of scraping across the surface, letting it skip across that surface, but keeping marks that are tightly packed. And hopefully that will be more effective. And then where we have sharper edges, so like here against the top edge of this claw, it's sharper and it kind of is softer as it rolls around that edge around the edge of the, the claw behind it. So I don't know if that was helpful at all. If anybody kind of stuck with those claws, um, let me know, see if I can try to help. The, the general rule though is, is if it's not really working, try to do less with it, right? That means you probably have too much detail, you've worked it too much, and you can often get away with less than you might think. So. Uh, Now we're in here. I'm going to move my way up here. Now there's, I really like this structure here. So as we, as we look at that, that back edge, I'm going to cut this in a little bit more into the shadow. And you can really observe how those folds tuck in behind there. Use these short kind of hatch marks along this that ridge there to help create that suggestion of that that ridge. Um, again, using but I'm directing the hatch marks in a way that aligns with the pattern of the scales. And then as we come down here, we're really wrapping around that edge. And I'm going to try something here. What happens if I just bring a light line right in there to suggest reflected light? Again, breaking up that space even more. Hopefully that helps. Apologize for my, my chair has just broke. So the leg part where I put my feet, it just clanks. And uh, I keep forgetting that and now it's very loud for you. So I apologize. All right, now back to this leg. I kind of took a detour. And I will get this. Um, this fold here on the shoulder established. I'm going to switch to the overhand grip and block in that shadow form. But, you know, I mentioned earlier the idea that, you know, contemplate the idea that all drawing is gesture drawing. Um, and, and that's really the way I'm trying to think about each of my marks is that it's a gesture that's representing some feature, right? And reacting to that form so that the, the marks themselves are directly referencing the structure, reacting to the form of, of that part. And it's not just a mark that kind of fills in the valley or fills in the space, but it's descriptive in some way. So even at the smallest scale, the marks become descriptive. So making some adjustments here to the scale of these marks that I had established. Just kind of reacting to the form and it may be totally off on some of these. Actually, I think I need to be somewhere in the middle. So with this, it's a really thin line, and I find it's going to be more effective to capture that as a, you see I'm zigzagging down that line. Actually, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is really focus on rounding this out. So I've got a, 
What am I doing? Okay. Here, if I look at the structure of this shoulder, we see this pattern really wrap up and around. And so where we're looking across the form, it's all of that information is being compressed. So just tightening up those marks to create that look that is coming up and around. And then we make another turn. And it's difficult to lock on to that pattern. So just try to try your best to see the contour marks and really observe the way that scale pattern changes as it wraps around the form. And if anything, you know, create marks that follow along that form, that cross contour marks. Even if they're slightly different than the, the pattern that you're seeing, defining the form uh, is going to, again, provide more information that the viewer will then fill in. And then I'm going to erase this out. I hope, I hope everybody's finding some of this useful. Um, This is, can get a little little long, but I think it can be helpful to really figure out a, a strategy for managing details. So here we're going to keep going. I'm going to keep moving up here, up the neck, and we'll worry about those spine things a little bit later. All right, again, cross contour information, looking at those folds. And when I can, if I see a thin line, I try to create that th that line not by not with an overhand grip, but by dragging along the side of the pencil. It just can it creates a mark that feels more naturally formed. All right, now I'm going to be able to go darker in some of these areas, but I'm going to start to suggest the darker folded areas. And that's really an important thing. If you're painting, if you're drawing, when you have a shadow, establishing at least two values in that shadow can go a long way in suggesting you know, light and shadow. So as a, as a solid value, it, it's kind of flat. You add another layer of something that's a little bit darker, and it can really enrich that whole kind of experience. So I'm just looking for those areas that are a little bit darker in here and, and using these broad marks to suggest them. And that, 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 that structure of value of the, in the shadows can be really helpful with, like I said, with painting as well as drawing. A little bit of reflected light in there, but before I lift any light, I'm going to darken the areas first. I think my default is to always go darker first, and then if I need to lighten up, I, I, I'll do that later. So right in here, I'm going to try to run my marks in a way that reinforces the form of that belly. And actually, what it's doing is it's drawing attention to the fact that there's very little information right in here. Take a deep breath. Kind of running out of things to say, but so I'm just drawing now. 
Um, oh, Karen's got a good question. Am I looking at the larger or smaller? I am kind of doing both, but I would say at this point, I'm looking more at the larger study. Um, but when I look up at the screen to evaluate the, the drawing, I'm doing a check-in with the smaller thumbnail. The smaller thumbnail really is help, more helpful in making sure that I have a, um, a solid value and light structure that as I add these details, um, these, these refinements, that I'm not losing the overall structure. So that can be, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it makes me, you know, bring to mind that, you know, be sure you're checking your work at a distance because as we start to add some of the texture and the detail, you want to make sure that all of it's adhering to the overall logic of light and shadow in your drawing and that there's no, um, there's no sense that that texture is kind of pasted in on top, that it's actually built into the structure as much as possible. Um, and you can see that more clearly at a distance. So, um, all right, so I just want to kind of come back in and I'm gonna be, uh, we're gonna have another pass where I'm going even darker, uh, but this, I'm kind of sneaking up on those values at this point. A lot of cool, really intricate folds in here. And I see a lot of reflected light, especially in here, but before I lift anything, again, I'm going to go make sure I've gone as dark as I can go in some of those areas, and then I'll evaluate because, again, value is all relative. It's all um, about relationships, and what we do is we calibrate our value structure um, based on the lightest lights and the darkest darks that we see available in the, the image. And as we uh, fill in more of that information, we are constantly recalibrating the value structure. So areas that we interpreted as dark because they were the darkest dark now are appearing lighter because we have something that's even darker that's been put into play as well. As I work on the shadow area, it becomes a negative space so I can use that to refine the edge of that leg there. Um, now there's some subtle reflected light in here that suggests the claw that's in shadow. The claw. Um, squinting my eyes, I'm going to just try to see the shapes. But what's most important, I think, right now, again, are the edges. The idea of a soft edge down here where the shadow is kind of projected onto the ground. And a hard edge here because that is the edge of the form. So that's how our, the viewer will understand uh, relatively quickly that in this shape here, we're looking at a combination of the form that's in the shadow as well as the cast shadow on the ground. If both of those edges were soft or both were hard, it would be of an entirely different shape that our mind would be interpreting. And as we as we move into the shadow here, I'm going to use the same technique that I did through here, just kind of finding that path kind of bouncing along that path as we scribe up and tightening things up as we wrap around the edge. Um, and this is a relatively hard edge here. And then what we see is a shift in value where this gets darker, you get more bounce light up here. So I'm gonna darken, I'm gonna keep you know, bringing these darken, darker values into this part of the leg. And keep playing around with that hatching. And lots of varied marks in there to hopefully give a suggestion of that depth. So, and texture. And 
And one of the things that can also be helpful to kind of keep in mind is to try to vary the, the direction of your marks with each plane change. You know, so here we have this, this fold in the skin. Um, there's that vertical edge, but change the direction of your marks on this plane that runs in a totally different direction. We come over here, come up and around, and you can change the direction of the marks here, really wrap down that, that edge of that fold to reinforce that depth. All right. Now getting into the head area. We see these larger scales. I'm not gonna, again, I'm not gonna be too precise with them. Just gonna try to feel out the shapes. Again, this is gesture drawing just at a smaller scale. And you can see how I'm rolling that pencil as I go, just kind of tapping along, trying to feel out the path that these marks fall along and, and roughly simulate them. And then one of the things that becomes apparent is that with this, whatever this bony structure is, you know, it's got a distinct value. It's very dark, um, but it, it integrates in with the scales immediately around it. So kind of pay attention to the direction of the marks as they, you know, interact with, the, again, the scales. What are the direction of the marks the scales are moving in? Um, as it as it abuts it. All right, thank you, Edie. Yeah, I like the analogy of that camera coming into focus. Right? That's that's very much like the way I think about it. Um, and you know, you look at photographs; many of them are you know beautiful because they're all soft and atmospheric. A lot of old photographs have very little detail compared to what we can get in our cameras today. Um, and I like to think about that as well. And what I think what is engaging about some old photographs is that it's how much it activates the imagination. And we fill in a lot of missing information. All right. Um, now, as we come up here, I'm going to, you know, making these kind of short marks, kind of dragging down along the, the edge of that lip. And we can see how a lot of these lines all kind of converge and then wrap down. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more. As we move into this area, what, one of the things that I really look at is orienting my pencil so in a way that kind of aligns with the general direction, the flow of that texture. As we come up here, for example, um, there's kind of two different directions to that, to that texture. Um, and in a lot of ways, I'm still, again, as, as we think about this as gesture drawing, looking at the form, holding that in my mind and allowing the marks to react to that form. When I'm looking at the paper, I'm mostly concerned with, the, you know, understanding where I am, making sure I'm in the right spot, not am I rendering it right. I'm just reacting to the form in a gestural way. Kind of losing that. Okay, we're kind of running out of the screen there, so let me bring it back into here. Uh, focus on the re the irregularity of these marks as well, or the of these details. It's so easy to fall into a pattern. I know I've talked about it a lot here in previous episodes. Is that my 
natural instinct is to just kind of run loose with my marks and I start going tick, 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 creating like a, a nice consistent pattern in the marks. Um, and I have to override that and force myself to take, make an observation, make one or two um, marks, I'll take a few stabs at it and then move on to the next observation. This is a really interesting feature here. Looks like it's some sort of eardrum. But it's amazing what you can describe simply by orienting the edge of your pencil in the, in the direction you want and then just kind of tapping. All right, now there are these distinct kind of horn, thorn, things. Um, and I'm looking at the shadow shape of them. So if you look at each one of them, they they have a form shadow and a cast shadow associated with them. And I'm looking to capture both in one, one go. And now I'm not, I'm not really calculating them. I'm just looking kind of generally in this area. Am I looking at smaller or larger ones? What's the general direction? So I come down here, they get larger. It gets smaller down in here again. And that's really the level of my observation. I'm not doing a lot of check-ins to make sure that I'm, I've got each one of those bumps placed exactly where it needs to go. Um, again, that's my kind of natural sensibility. And you may want to be a bit more precise with that. Either way, it's, it's all good. Um, all right. Now I'm going to... Just kind of do another pass through here to make sure that I've got everything I want. Um, a lot of those marks, I'm just barely scraping the edge of the paper. And actually, it's gotten darker in here, so I'm going to adjust the exposure. Um, and then we'll deal with we'll deal with those spikes in the back last, I think. All right, so in, back to this eye. Uh, I'm seeing variations in the value, so I'm not I'm not focusing on that as much as the shadow shape, if I can define that. Um, and these, as I'm as I'm looking at these forms, again, these are just a combination of kind of scribing along the edge of the pencil and then dropping down vertically when I need to. You're looking here on the lips where these marks get closer together, but then you, they start to open up and become more broad. So we wrap up around kind of the nostrils. And then with the mouth, again, we're wrapping around there. So pay attention to how things start to kind of tighten up as you wrap around that snout. It's awesome. Just reflecting now on where my mind is at versus when I started, and it's a completely different mindset. It feels great. So yeah, drawing is definitely a way for me to. It's definitely a form of meditation because it it comes into focus, brings, makes the the brain feel like it's clicking in some way. And painting does the same thing. All right, now, now here, let's get into that eye form. Here's my little eraser. I'm gonna erase out the that upper eyelid highlight, that lower eyelid highlight, just using the corner of my eraser. And there's a little bit of light. Let's see, I can... I can sharpen it along the top of the eyebrow. So just trying to focus on where the light is hitting more. And there 
there's a distinct highlight here. I think this this vanish eraser can lift a bit more. So I'll use the corner of that. It's not as precise, but it lifts beautifully. Now, since I've, I've cut out too much of that highlight, I can refine that a little bit. I can finish it with that upper eyelid. Now, because we're looking at that eye at an angle, one of the things I want you to pay attention to is the fact that it's not a pure kind of teardrop shape. There's a distinct change in the angles as we move from the left side to the right side. And then right here, you actually see the sphere of the eye being a bit more dominant. Uh, so really look at that, that change in shape, and that's what's going to create that depth. And the eye is, a, is a, another area where it's easy to get wrapped up in the, in the symbol of it all. And, and stop looking at the, the specific form. Now we're getting close to really adding the final details. I think we've got the overall form kind of established. I do want to erase out a little bit more of the highlight here as much as I can. All right, so now I'm going to get here. Um, he is wearing a tie. <laughs> That's awesome. He's a very, he's a fancy iguana. <laughs> All right. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time overthinking these spine things. I just want to, you know, just like every other detail, just kind of pay attention to where I am in the form, kind of what direction am I looking at. All right, so here we've got this kind of dominant one. They're a little bit longer up top. And you can see how I've got that soft edge. We'll clean that up. And then there's this guy here that's kind of bent over. They start to kind of curl at the top, so I'll make curly marks. They're tighter and smaller as we move to the back, kind of moving every which way. So I'm making marks that get shorter as I go to the back and moving every which way. Again, I didn't measure these out, but this is, again, this may be an area that you want to be more precise with or maybe not. But to go in and sharpen it, I'm going to use the, the 2B again. It's not the darkest one I've got, uh, but you can kind of come in in the negative space and refine those forms. Now these ones here, these kind of spikes at the top of the, the head have a value to them, they kind of have a halo around them. I can use this eraser if I need to create more precise edge work. So don't be afraid to really kind of work the paper in areas like this. But you can be, um, you can also be loose and gestural at the same time. Uh, so what I mean by that is, you know, I'm going to kind of sneak up on the areas where I sharpen it. I'm not going to sharpen each and every one of those spikes. Right now, all of this area looks a little fuzzy and out of focus. So if I if I just bring, say, like this notch here into focus a little bit more, that adds a little bit more clarity to that whole area. If I start going in and outlining and contour lining each and every one of these spikes, 
it may overwhelm the drawing. So if you are kind of inclined to really define each of those spikes, then my suggestion would be to start light, uh, make in, in terms of value, light and sharp. Um, don't use your darkest darks in there. Um, step back from it at a distance to really see how it's all reading. But again, I'm going to use the power of suggestion here just to drop in a few of these uh, kind of sharper edges. And that my hope is then in that is that the viewer's mind will kind of accept that as um, kind of in focus, not a priority, and will fill in that missing information without requiring it from us. So now I'm kind of focusing on edges and looking for areas where I can start to bring a little bit more refinement. Now, it's, but again, not, not in terms of sharp contour lines. Uh, I want to zoom in a little bit and so you can see that. And so along that back, I don't want to have a, a solid line along that whole back edge. I'm going to use some of, the, some of these sharper edges. You can see like, up close, it's really quite a mess. It's very sketchy. But the hope is that as, as, we, as we zoom out, actually what I'm going to do is we'll zoom out in a little bit as we zoom out, that we'll kind of accept that and all those little kind of darker marks that I've established here will um, kind of accumulate together and be accepted by the viewer's mind. And uh, hopefully that is because we have that solid underlying structure of light and shadow and these little marks that I'm making here aren't necessarily interfering with that. They're just bringing a little kind of a, attention and sharpness to the form that kind of gets lost at a distance. So this is where I'm bringing in some of that line work. Oh, good night, Dita. That's a long time for you to be up. I appreciate you putting in that time. I'm going to kind of race out some of that negative space in here, feather it out a touch. Now, along this edge, you know, one option I have is to darken that background, but I don't know if I want to do that. Now I'm going to bring out my 6B, my darkest dark, and find areas where I can now add uh, an additional layer of depth and use this more for line work and edge work. Um, actually, I think I can, let me see what happens if I, I don't think I can lift off any more here. Those highlights. So along this top edge, for example, I can, you know, there's a there's a strength in the in the contrast along that top edge uh, because of how dark that background is. But since I'm not going to go dark there, what I can do is use a little bit of line work. So bring in that sharp edge there, bring in this sharp edge, and it's definitely along that snout to try to create a kind of a more gestural line there. So I'm still thinking about direction of the marks. Think a lot about cross contour and creating variation. So none of these marks I'm making is, is going to be a line that follows along the whole 
contour of a form. It's just to, to add sharpness and depth to a specific area. And I say if I want to kind of sharpen this edge a little bit, I can bring a little bit of a line. Again, a broken line. Can I connect the dots? Let the viewer's mind fill that in. And now bringing even more depth into this shadow area. Um, and then under here as well. This is where I really want to make sure I'm paying attention to the cross contour marks. Like under here, really kind of reinforce the, the rounded quality of the belly. And I can bring that, I can bring that foot forward even more by bringing that line out, giving more depth to that. I can bring this out more by bringing more depth to this line. So we talked earlier about the, you know, the kind of the difference between using line and shape to define a form. So in this case, we're using line selectively the, you know, again, those contour lines don't exist in nature, but there's something that we, you know, we, we naturally are inclined to recognize and to render. And I think I need to bring a little bit more depth and dimension to these claws, focusing more on that shadow, the shadow shapes than anything, and then the tips of those claws. All right, so hopefully that's been helpful. We ran a little bit longer than anticipated. Um, but that's because this iguana is so much fun to draw. Um, I hope you, I hope you have enjoyed this. We will be meeting next week, 3 p.m. Eastern for drawing together. I'm working on a moonrise, uh, drawing and charcoal for next week. Um, and I, like I said, I hope this has been helpful, especially with regard to the power of suggestion you know, building up to those details so it does, they don't feel so overwhelming. And if you can use the tools, uh, kind of natural marks and be thinking about dimension and light and shadow, you can create something that suggests more detail than it might other have otherwise. So, oh yeah, happy birthday, Heather. I saw that on Facebook there. Hope you were enjoying it in a wonderful way. Um, so there you have it. So I could keep working on this forever. And if you've got plenty more, uh, more time, go ahead, keep working on it. But I think this is at a stage now where we can call it good. And now any sort of additional work is really just your own sensibility. What do you feel like doing? What's, what kind of a drawing experience do you want to have? That's kind of some of the questions that you can be asking yourself. So I appreciate it. Thank you all for joining me. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Oh, and then Leslie, what color paper for next week? I'm actually, that's a really good question. So I just started it. This is the early stage here. Um, this is actually on a, um, the Somerset kind of lightly gray paper. I want to be able to show the contrast. So here's this drawing. 
I flipped it over, there's pure white. You can see how that's got a light tone to it. So that's what I'll be working on. Uh, so it's a light toned paper for next week. So my hope is to get that posted soon. I've been a little bit behind on getting everything set up, but hopefully earlier and you can see